so first, um, I want to just uh, review why this is relevant, why this whole topic is relevant. And um, as you, anybody's heard, with the opiate crisis, um, clearly we need to have more discussions about how to manage pain, how to deal with chronic issues of pain um, without relying on opiates, which has been the common practice over the past couple of decades. So obviously it's very prevalent. 100 million adults suffer from chronic pain. Uh, to define uh, chronic pain is uh, defined as any pain that persists beyond the time that you would expect natural tissue healing to occur. And arbitrarily, that's kind of cut off about three months. So if somebody has a chronic pain pattern persisting beyond that time, we then shift gears. We treat that very differently than we would acute pain. If you look at how many opiates are utilized in the world, you can see that our population of Americans is only 4.6% of the entire population, yet we are the major utilizers of opiates. And this is a dramatic shift. So back a couple of decades ago, um, this was not a common practice, but there were two things that occurred that changed the culture. One was in 1980, a letter or a a physician at Boston University, Herschel Jerk, uh, was a bit, had the database of hospitals available to him, and he was interested in addiction. So he had his postgrad student uh, review the charts of a number of hospital patients, and they looked at over or nearly 40,000 patients. Of those, 12, nearly 12,000 patients were provided with um, opiates during their hospital stay. They then followed these patients upon discharge and found that there were only about four patients that showed any signs of addiction. And so his conclusion was, wow, look at this. These are really pre pretty benign medications. We can prescribe these much more freely in that setting because this risk of addiction that we were so worried about really isn't that prevalent. So he wrote a letter to the New England Journal of Medicine stating this. That letter was then taken out of context for the next two decades. And his statement about how use of opiates um, only rarely results in addiction, was then uh, quoted over and over again and was uh, given as a reason why we should be more comfortable prescribing. That was in addition to a culture where people were believing that um, compassionately we were not addressing chronic pain conditions and that people were suffering. And so the idea was that why are we holding back? Pain was considered the fifth vital sign. Why are we holding back? Um, treatments that can alleviate suffering when it's really not a very dangerous modality. So people began to prescribe much more freely. If you can see now, in the, just in 2017 alone, there were about 72,000 deaths from opiates. Now most of these opiate overdoses that occurred were from illicit drugs, either heroin or other um, narcotic analgesics that were not prescribed by, by the patient's physician. But most of those patients were introduced through either a prescription of their own or through a family member or somebody who shared with them. So once there's an exposure, I mean, these, are, these can change somebody's life, especially in adolescence. It's very important that people be aware. If you do have narcotics at home, if you've finished your course, you're done, you've had your surgical treatment um, and you're post-op and you're done, you need to get rid of those. Um, and they certainly need to be kept in a safe place. Uh, so the exposure is a huge concern. And in fact, personally, I can say when I started my anesthesia residency back in the 90s, there was an uptick in suicides amongst uh, anesthesia residents and a big concern about um, opiate addiction because of the access. And so I was made to watch a documentary called Behind the Mask, and it showcased um, a chief resident at UC San Francisco who was found dead in his call room. And this is a, a gentleman who was very well respected, smart, uh, well-adjusted person who nobody would have predicted that kind of an outcome for him. But what the conclusion was is that with the exposure and then the access, many people who may not have ever gone down that path, when a stressor came along, they thought, oh, well, what's the harm, right? And you don't know whether or not you're, you're somebody who would become addicted, right? Um, you could very easily be. And so it's just never is worth the risk. And so we really want to minimize exposure so that we don't um, pique anybody's interest, right? That's, the, that's one of the first things. So as providers, independent of your field of medicine, you're going to come across patients with chronic pain. You're going to be asked to participate in their care. So this is the WHO ladder that describes um, prescribing 
um, ladder for how we how we start at uh, the lowest or weakest medications and then work on up depending on the severity of pain. So ideally we would be starting with um, medications such as um, the non-opiates of course and then moving up only to using opiates if necessary when pain is particularly severe. All along the way you can see that there's the, um, the addition of adjunct uh, medications or other treatments and that's an important thing to keep in mind because typically those are often skipped. So these are not entirely inclusive, but these are four basic modalities of how we can think about um, treating pain. So clearly medications play an important role. There's physical modalities that are uh, important, psychological modalities, and then invasive treatments. None of these um, has are in, in excludes the other. So typically when you're treating somebody with a pain condition, you're gonna go back and forth and borrowing from any of these, these groups. So uh, the non-opiate medications, there's a number of different medications. We're gonna go touch on all of these in just a little bit of detail, but here's a brief list. Before we get into that, though, I do wanna describe an up and coming area, and this is genetic testing for polymorphism. So, we know already the oncologists utilize this information. So if you have a cancer they want to treat, they'll usually often look at the, um, the genetics of that cancer before they formulate a treatment plan to look at which, which chemotherapeutic drug will be most effective, right? Um, now there are uh, many centers that before prescribing an antidepressant will look and see what, what your uh, genotype is and whether or not a particular medication is likely to be efficacious for you. The same thing in narcotic analgesics and many other types of treatments. And so you may know this just from your personal experience. Some people may say, oh, I've tried ibuprofen, doesn't work for me, but Aleve really works or vice versa or whatever. So there's, there's variation from person to person genetically. And this whole area of medicine is really in its infancy. We'll probably see a lot more utilization of this in the future, which will help guide us to give better therapies. So acetaminophen or Tylenol is one of the first line treatments people typically um, commonly will have this in their home and utilize this for minor pain conditions. Uh, up to four grams a day is considered safe in somebody without any liver disease. Obviously with any liver disease, uh, this would be contraindicated or much lower dose. Um, beyond four grams a day, the pathway of metabolism goes to uh, a different pathway and produces a toxic metabolite that then leads to hepatotoxicity. Many patients aren't necessarily aware of this four gram uh, limit, and so you'll often see patients that say, yeah, I'll take you know two to four Tylenol every three to four hours. It's like, eh. So um, be mindful of that. Anti-inflammatory medications, again, are another first line medication um, that's utilized in a home environment typically, and um, most effective when uh, the pain either involves inflammation or some type of bone pain, something of that nature. Um, and uh, common ones that you've probably heard of are ibuprofen or naproxen, those are both over the counter. Diclofenac is uh, a prescription medication. And then meloxicam and Celebrex are two um, medications that are typically reserved for patients with GI upset with anti-inflammatories. Uh, the di diclofenac uh, also comes in topical forms. There are a number of topical medications and these are grossly underutilized. So we don't typically think of these initially, but you know, patients will often utilize things like Icy Hot or Bengay or something like that topically that may have some um, soothing properties. Um, additionally, the anti-inflammatories, there are at least three different preparations of diclofenac that are a gel form, a cream, um, and then a patch that can be useful. Um, capsaicin cream, may, many of you may have been familiar with this. This was um, touted as being a, a good treatment for post herpetic neuralgia. If any of you have had patients who've tried it for that reason, it's not really popular. They already hurt a lot, and when you put the cap capsaicin cream on, it initially causes um, more pain. So it's from the chili pepper, so they'll get burning on their skin. Their skin already hurts, so they're not going to be really happy with that. But after several days, they do get depletion of their substance P, and so they'll, be, they'll have less pain. Um, there are a number of compounding pharmacies that make um, topical preparations that utilize really the whole cl different classes of medications, including antidepressants, anti-seizure medications, um, the NMDA receptor antagonists that can be really, really helpful. They're very expensive, not typically covered by insurance, and so it has a limited utility because a lot of patients can't afford these. 
So once somebody has um, typically makes it into like a clinic like mine where they've already utilized anti-inflammatories, Tylenol, topicals, um, and they're looking at other types of treatment modalities, again, remembering the different, the physical modalities and psychological, those you want to be reaching for as well. But in terms of medications, tricyclic antidepressants are commonly used amongst chronic pain patients. And um, years ago, when uh, tri uh, the tricyclics were, um, have not been used or don't, aren't typically used for depression anymore. The doses for depression are significantly higher than we need to use for um, pain management. But what was noted is as they were ramping up the dose for treatment of depression years ago, they found that people who had pain were saying, gee, my depression's still bad, but my pain's better. So that's when they first discovered that, and it's been used really ever since. So the side effect profile of these can be significant, but at the lower doses, they're typically well tolerated, and it's really a matter of ramping up slowly. Um, they all cause significant sedation, so they're useful to be used just at night before bed. And for many people who have chronic pain, they don't sleep well, so it can be beneficial in that regard as well. Duloxetine or Cymbalta is a newer medication that has FDA approval both for a number of different chronic pain conditions, but also for uh, depression itself. So that medication is commonly used um, for patients with chronic pain and has, um, has tremendous efficacy and usually well tolerated. The other um, antidepressants um, are largely used for treating the depression. Probably don't have a huge impact on the pain directly, but by improving the mood, then uh, they may improve a person's function and activity and other things that would lend to improvement in their pain condition as well. Anti-seizure medications. Um, there's two medications, both gabapentin and pregabalin are the most common anti-seizure medications used in pain management. They both bind to the same receptor. Their activity is very similar. Pregabalin is a newer medication and binds with a greater affinity to the same receptor. Um, if you think about um, a seizure in general, so it's an area of, of uh, brain tissue that's uh, firing abnormally creating the seizure. With a chronic pain condition, if you think about, say you had your hand on a hot stove and that would signal for you to take your hand out of harm's way. So your hand is removed, maybe now you're a week out, the skin's healed, there's no reason for that signal to, to persist. It's not, it's not relaying any useful information anymore. So you can think of it as that, that nerve is kind of like having a seizure, it's hyperactive, and we don't want it to be hyperactive. So the anti-seizure medications can help soothe that nerve, nerve and decrease the firing. Particularly useful for uh, neuropathies, um, and any type of neuropathic pain. Tegretol is um, rarely used anymore, except in the case of trigeminal neuralgia. Um, it's a little bit messier drug to use, and you have to, um, you do have to do check a CPC because of the risk of aplastic anemia. And Depakote and valproic acid are still used for migraine headaches. There are a number of different uh, muscle relaxants that can be useful. Um, Almost all of the, actually all of the muscle relaxants typically cause sedation, so many people cannot tolerate these during the day, but they can take a bedtime dose, which may enhance their sleep and um, provide uh, pain relief for sleeping as well. Um, typical uh, muscle relaxants include um, flexoril or cyclobenzaprine, um, uh, baclofen, tizanidine, um, epicarbamol. There's a number of different ones that are very useful. I guess I could include on there as well uh, Botox, which isn't exactly a muscle relaxant, but rather a paralyzing agent that um, is used to treat severe spasms, like things uh, such as like cervical dystonia. It's also used in migraine headaches quite effectively. So NMDA receptor antagonists, this is an area that we really, um, a lot of research is in this area that shows a lot of promise, or, and we're hopeful that we'll have a better drug at some point that can uh, work at the NMDA receptor. Right now, the, the most common drug that you might have heard of is methadone. Um, methadone, however, is also an opiate. So it binds to both the opiate receptor and to the NMDA receptor. Um, but it does provide very profound analgesia. Um, ketamine is probably the most effective NMDA receptor um, antagonist that we have. Unfortunately, it's wrought with a lot of other issues, including addiction potential. But it is, um, does provide very profound analgesia. And if any of you have had the opportunity to work in a burn unit or um, in some sort of environment like that where you need 
um, quick, safe onset of anesthetic um, to provide like dressing changes or that kind of thing. Um, it's frequently used because it really does provide quite profound analgesia. Um, it is only uh, typically used either intravenously or intranasally, so it limits its use utility on an outpatient basis, and also it's highly addictive, so it isn't really um, particularly favorable in that regard. There are two centers, uh, UCLA and Stanford, that have um, uh, ketamine clinics where they'll do uh, five-day admissions and provide uh, in, uh, continuous infusion of ketamine uh, for treating really complicated chronic pain conditions like a, a uh, total body complex regional pain syndrome. In those situations, um, a five-day treatment will then render these people um, with reductions of pain for up to four to five months. Tramadol is actually um, categorized as an opiate. It has very weak um, activity at the opioid receptor, um, but it also um, blocks the reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine, so it increases those levels. Um, and this is another drug that may be useful when we get more genetic testing available because this is a drug that can be highly effective for one patient and it may not work for the next nine that you try, uh, try it with. Additionally, it does have an addiction potential, but again, fairly rarely. So there'll be maybe one person in 10 that finds it um, pleasurable and then will maybe perhaps misuse it. Um, there's a number of other medications or, or foods uh, that have been touted as having uh, some utility in managing pain. Uh, turmeric is anti-inflammatory um, and may have some, some utility in decreasing pain. Um, CBD oil, of course, this is really popular in Colorado now. Um, you can buy CBD prepar preparations that do not have any THC in it. Uh, however, um, I was informed by a police officer recently that I think the law mandates that uh, CBD oils purchased at a um, a dispensary have to have at least a small percentage of THC in it. Um, and I, there are no, um, no good studies right now that really show that THC has much efficacy in pain management. CBD oil may have some anecdotal uh, benefit. Certainly it helps people relax and helps them sleep. <clears throat> so physical modalities. There's a number, this is not an exhaustive list. These are some modalities that most of you may have uh, of utilized yourself or been familiar with. Um, a TENS unit is um, very useful for uh, providing pain relief for a number of different, different conditions, including fibromyalgia, um, lower back pain, uh, neck pain. Uh, those are probably the most common uh, conditions for which it's utilized. Um, the one thing about a TENS unit, um, it's you know, very safe, there's uh, really no side effects. Uh, the downside is that it, people do develop tachyphylaxis to it, so after chronic use, um, they will stop having any benefit. So one of the techniques that can be used to try to um, prolong their benefit is to um, have them use it more variably intermittently. So if I have a patient who does find benefit from it, they can just limit it to an hour every few days or something, they may, it may last them a lot longer. Um, aerobic exercise, now this per se isn't necessarily a, a pain um, management treatment, but we do know that as you increase activity, you increase blood flow, you're removing, you're delivering more nutrients, you're removing toxins, and these all are useful for keeping the tissue healthier. So we wanna try to keep, even if a person isn't able to exercise um, their entire body, the area that they can work, if, they're, if they can't move their legs, maybe they can exercise their upper body, any kind of aerobic activity is useful for improving blood flow to the entire body. The other thing is that we know that there are epigenetic changes that occur as we exercise. So, um, in fact, there was a study looking at sedentary um, subjects that were um, placed in a exercise program for a period of six months, and they showed epigenetic changes uh, in nearly 8,000 different genes. So you do have a pretty significant impact on, on the course of a disease based on how active you can maintain yourself. So um, again, I think at one point we believe that our, you know, our genetics is our genetics. We can't really change that. There's more evidence that shows that actually our, um, our genetics is um, fairly plastic. We do have a lot of ability to determine which of the, our genes are actually expressed. And you, you know, we all know that um, each um, cell in our body, whether it's a brain cell or a liver cell, has the same genetic 
um, information, yet they're different because of different expression. So that expression uh, or variation of expression continues, and we have uh, ability to impact that based on our environmental exposures, our um, exercise activity, our sleep patterns, um, our joy, things like that that we that can have huge, huge change in what's expressed. Strength training, uh, particularly useful uh, for protection of joints. So anytime a person has a, um, a weakness in a joint or a uh, injury to a joint area, strengthening the muscles about that joint are protective. Obviously this needs to be done under guidance. So uh, you know, a trained physical therapist um, or trainer would be very useful in rehabbing uh, specifically a joint. The other thing is that people often develop asymmetry. So if they have uh, an injury in uh, one leg and they don't use that leg so much or that arm, and then they have uh, asymmetries in how they carry themselves, and then subsequently other, other ailments develop. And you know, we'll often see somebody who's had you know, foot surgery, and then they, they're put in a boot, and so their gait's off, and then they come in and now they have new onset back pain, right? Well, why is that? It's because they're, they're now their gait is not ideal. So stretching just maintains uh, the function and um, a movement of the joint, which again, improves the general health of the joint. Uh, core strengthening is useful again. So if you think about if you're ever lifting something and that it's beyond the strength of what your um, arms can do, then that, that extra um, uh, force then gets transferred over to your spine. If, you're, if your muscles supporting your spine, which include your abdomen and your back muscles, if those are not adequate, then that gets transferred over to your disc and other structures. So the more, um, the more uh, um, strength you have about those supporting structures, the better you'll be. And again, if you can't use yourself, if you can't move a joint, it's important to keep movement, keep range of motion there. So even passive motion has utility. Um, and it, balance work isn't, again, specifically for pain management, but as you know, we all, uh, our, our balance diminishes with age, and this is uh, a area that if you don't continue to work on your balance, you'll continue to lose more and more uh, with each passing year, so it's important to keep challenging yourself. Uh, I have a lot of my older patients all suggest that to brush their teeth on one foot, to um, you know, practice with a BOSU ball or something standing in a doorway. Um, those are important things that we, we take for granted, but it, you know, if you think about it, if you talk a lot of older people will often you know, say, oh, you know, they fell and broke their hip, and as you query what happened, they'll say, oh, I tripped over a rug, or uh, I hit a, you know, a little uh, something, uh, an unlevel curb, or something like that. Those are all things that we all do every day of our lives, right? But you don't fall when you're 20, but you do fall when you're 80, and the difference there is that they aren't able to catch themselves. They don't have the the balance controls that they once had. So those things are, need to really be maintained. A person with chronic pain will often have guarded behavior. They'll have um, just ways of carrying themselves that are um, not ideal. So they're more apt to have falls and mishaps. Massage therapy, um, again, just uh, human touch is relaxing and um, provides release of uh, different neurochemicals that are uh, pain relieving, releases anxiety, um, but also um, uh, provides myofascial release, improves muscle flow, and range of motion. Acupuncture, um, there are a number of studies that have looked at acupuncture and, and what exactly is occurring. We do know that there is some release of uh, endorphins with placement of, uh, of needles. Now, with acupuncture specifically, these are placed along meridians that are very specific. Um, and whether or not that is um, the reason why uh, people get benefit or whether it's just the needles in general is unclear. Um, there is also dry needling, which is much less specific in where these needles are placed. Oftentimes they're placed right into a trigger point and people get excellent relief from that and they're clearly not in meridians. Um, dry needling is um, more available to most patients because it's often in, uh, covered on their insurance. They can go through physical therapy. Many people do not have the benefit of acupuncture. Heat is useful in uh, providing relaxation of, of muscle spasms, um, and it's also relaxing. Uh, ice uh, is useful for numbing, but um, 
you do need to be careful. Uh, we typically think of using ice in the acute setting, so if somebody has acute inflammation or acute injury, but with a chronic um, pain condition, oftentimes we're looking at really wanting to promote blood flow, so it may not be as useful on a long-term basis. Um, I think most importantly are psychological factors when you're addressing chronic pain, and the reason for that is you think about, um, you know, this is probably the most missed category. So most of us don't have tremendous background in uh, psychology or uh, that's, that's not the basis of our training. And, and so this may get missed. Also people oftentimes don't, do not have this benefit with their insurance and so they're not often sent off to uh, receive psychotherapy when it could be really useful. I think I hit the wrong button. Uh oh. So again, some of the neurochemicals that are released with just having support, love, uh, somebody who cares about you are very useful for maintaining mood and decreasing pain. Um, emotional support. <clears throat> so if you think about a person who has chronic pain, there are a number of adjustments that have to um, occur. So I think one of the best examples I can think of, of off the top of my head is if any of you are familiar with uh, Amy Van Dyken, who was a speaker at the neurosurgery conference a couple of years ago, um, a six-time gold medalist, amazing woman, right, in an ATV accident and is now paraplegic, right? She is one of the most inspirational people I've ever heard. So imagine what an adjustment it was for her when she was dealing with chronic pain, but also dealing with loss of function of her body when she was using her body at such an elite level, right? So, yeah, at this day, she's happy, well-adjusted, and she's an incredibly inspirational person. So every person has to deal with some type of an adjustment. It may be that they've lost their job. They might have lost um, their, their relationships. They might have lost uh, activities that they really enjoyed. Those are all things that they have to grieve through, and they have to adjust to their new state, right? So if, if what they currently have is going to never allow them to do that activity again, they're going to have to figure out a new path, right? So it's not just like, I can't do that, and therefore life's over. It's, what's my new story? So having family and emotional supports are really helpful for patients to get there and to um, make those adjustments. And as a, as a provider, that's one of the most important things you look for. Does this person have the tools? Do they have the family support or the significant other or other people in their lives that are going to help them through that? An important thing to consider also is caretakers. So a lot of times, you know, we think about the person who, we, all the things they've lost, they're suffering. Uh, but spouses, for example, maybe now they have a spouse who can't work or a spouse who um, doesn't enjoy the activities they enjoy together. So just being cognizant of those issues as well um, is really important so that you can give them the support they need so they can then keep continuing to support the, the person who's dealing with a chronic pain. Socialization, now for many people this may be their worst nightmare, but if you enjoy social settings, there's utility to, um, to just having connections with humans, other humans, but also um, a distraction. So. Uh, you can imagine that if you have a severe pain condition and you're able to um, engage in your favorite activity with your favorite people, you still might have that pain condition, but you may not notice it as much, right? It's still there, but you're able to be distracted from it. So we can kind of think about um, as a, like a bandwidth. We have certain bandwidth that allows transmission of, of pain signals. And if we have enough other pleasurable activity along those those um, neurons, then we're going to have less room or less pay less attention to our painful stimuli. This is probably one of the most important um, treatments or, or most effective treatments. And if a patient has purpose or reason to carry on or, or something that they feel is important to overcome their condition, this will keep them more likely to keep them active than anything else. So whether it's volunteering or um, continuing working in some capacity or um, caring for animals, whatever it is that, that they enjoy that gives them reason is very useful in, in uh, helping them both with their mood, keeping their functional activity as high as possible, and diminishing pain, pain over time.
meditation is, um, you know, it can be done in many forms. It can be just a, a quiet few moments to yourself. It can be formal meditation. There is a, a website or a, um, an app that can be downloaded called Headspace, which um, walks people through how to meditate, how to get started, um, and gives you some tools there. Uh, there are some people who are very advanced with this that are able to, through meditation or biofeedback, other different modalities, are able to separate themselves from pain. And though they still acknowledge that they have pain, it doesn't bother them. Um, that is a skill set that takes a while to develop, and some people have a little more ability than others. John Sarno is an author of a number of books specifically on this subject, if you're interested, that um, a lot of people find very useful in coping with chronic pain. Music and nature are two other modalities that um, are useful in ca causing calmness, relaxation, decreasing anxiety, and helping people cope with their chronic pain. So other interventions, um, this is again not exhaustive, but some of the different types of treatments. And these, the first three that we went through, um, the medications, physical modalities, and psychological modalities, those are all used concomitantly. So typically, you know, you're trying to stay as um, conservative as possible, minimizing um, uh, treatments or minimizing invasiveness of treatment um, to see if you can get the person's pain under control. Many times though, other treatments are necessary. So steroid injections, for example, anywhere there's a joint essentially, um, steroid can be injected there and has utility. You have, I'm sure people are familiar with patients who've had their shoulders injected or knees. Uh, and um, my practice, I do a number of spinal injections and these can be done anywhere from the neck all the way down through the, through the tailbone. Um, PRP injections, uh, this is an area, um, a newer area, where a patient has um, a sample of blood that's removed typically from their antecubital fossa. This is uh, spun down, centrifuge, and then uh, a, a portion of that platelet-rich plasma is then taken off and that's injected into the, the area of injury. Um, the idea here is that these contain a number of um, growth factors and humoral elements that will uh, cause uh, healing of the tissue. There's probably also a, a very low number of stem cells, uh, pluripotent cells that may have some utility in uh, assisting with healing as well. And these could be injected just about into any, any injured tissue commonly. They're injected into um, ligaments um, and uh, tendons and into joint areas. Stem cell injections or stem cell therapy um, is a newer area as well. And there's a number of different uh, ways of obtaining stem cells, but uh, probably the most common is to, through a bone marrow aspirate where these are then processed. And then those pluripotent stem cells are then injected back into the area of injury. And they have the ability then to, um, to heal the tissue, especially like in areas where, like cartilage, for example, is an area where these, uh, the, the cartilage does not typically heal itself very well. So this is one area of promise. Rhizotomies um, are, is a specific treatment where um, in the spine, um, uh, predominantly in the spine, this is where a nerve is actually burned and um, injured so that it's no longer functional. So there's not very many nerves that you can do a rhizotomy to and not have um, side effects or, or problems with. But specifically in the spine, from the cervical spine down through the lumbar spine, there are nerves that innervate the facet joints. And the facet joints are the joints that allow movement, so movement of your head um, or, or rotation of your, your spine. And Typically, anybody over the age of 50 uh, will have some arthritis in those joints and with activity, um, especially people who have been uh, athletic in their past and so forth, or laborers, you'll see frequently a lot of arthritis in those joints, and that presents as pain in the neck area, be just pain in the neck and shoulders, or in the lower back and just in the lower back region, and can be very challenging to treat. Um, with rhizotomies, um, a needle is placed over uh, the medial branch nerve, and a uh, current is run through that to heat that nerve up and to kill it. So it doesn't disrupt the nerve's integrity, so it, it kills the nerve, but the nerve is still, um, uh, the outer portion of the nerve is still intact. So because of that, the nerve will regenerate. So you'll see regeneration over a period of six months to two years, but during that period, the patient will have reduction of pain. It can be really substantial. 
Um, it would not be useful in treating radicular pain. Radicular pain is um, a result of uh, a motor nerve also is involved, and so if you did a rhizotomy there, you would obviously cause potential injury. Spinal cord stimulation is a, a modality to treat pain of uh, almost any etiology. Um, it was, um, it's most useful to treat pain of radicular nature, so either a cervical radicular pain or uh, lumbar pain. Uh, like lower extremity leg pain. Recently though, there's been some changes in the uh, programming um, uh, where with higher frequency um, stimulation, you can actually get really good coverage of axial or just a back or just neck pain. Um, this procedure involves placing a very small electrode into uh, the epidural space. This can be done either percutaneously through a needle or in some cases it has to be done um, through a surgical incision. and uh, that uh, electrode then is then uh, tunneled down into the uh, lower back or hip region and attached to a generator. And then this generator is programmed and runs a, um, a, a electrical pattern that then will um, mask the pain. So a patient will end up experiencing, at the lower frequencies, will actually experience a vibration or tingly sensation into either their uh, back and leg or their neck and arm. Um, or in the trunk area. Um, at the higher frequencies, they may not experience anything. They may not hardly feel anything, but yet it can have a huge impact on their pain. The battery typically lasts about nine years. If it, when it needs to be replaced, a small incision is made over the hip that is removed and just reattached to the electrode. So the electrodes stay in place. Surgical intervention, again, depending on what the um, uh, problem is, there are some cases where if you've done everything you can do and there's a surgical uh, fix, of course, at that point, you know, rather than have a person continue to go through a bunch of modalities when there's an easy surgical fix, you'd want to do that. So uh, a herniated disc is um, an example. Frequently, this will repair themselves on their own or um, diminish over time. But in cases where you've done conservative care and they have not, then there are excellent surgical options. <laughs>